When we look at the real reasons behind hunger, always conflict, climate extremes, and economic downturns and slowdowns are the major reasons behind the increase in the hunger and the nourishment that we are facing today. Food insecurity worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. Chronic and acute hunger on the rise across the globe. We'll explore the reasons behind it and the implications here in the United States, the largest economy in the world. Hello everyone, I'm Asiye Namdar, filling in for Anna Naidu, and you're watching The Heat. Along with masks, food banks have become one of the most striking symbols of the COVID-19 pandemic. By some estimates, tens of millions of people in the U.S. alone are now at risk of food insecurity. And as Owen Furclough reports, it's a global problem that goes beyond hunger. Brianne Walker is raising three children and two siblings on her own in New Hampshire while struggling to make ends meet with only part-time work. So she needs every dollar of the government's expanded child tax credit. It's going back into the daycare. It's going into the food. It's going to the grocery store. As inflation in the U.S. pushes food prices up, at least she's able to feed her family at a time when COVID-19 has put some 42 million people in danger of food insecurity, according to the NGO Feeding America. Food banks and food distribution centers have been springing up across the United States during the pandemic. This one, in the Anacostia neighborhood of Washington, D.C., opened up in the spring. And food insecurity is as much about having access to food as having enough of it to eat. D.C. Hunger Solutions found that the Anacostia neighborhood is one of two wards in the U.S. capital with the fewest number of grocery stores. It's also one of the poorest neighborhoods with a high percentage of black residents. And in the U.S., the two tend to go hand in hand with food insecurity. For the United Nations, food insecurity is a global problem whose origins lie at the start of the food supply chain in countries like Pakistan. If you really want to fix food systems, you've got to listen to the people who work in them. The rural small-scale farmers, they produce about one third of our global food but too often they receive a pittance for their effort and are left vulnerable to shocks. They include the impact of global warming on crops as well as price fluctuations. The UN now wants coordinated global action against both to help create a more equitable food production system. Owen Fairclough, CDTN, Washington. We have a lot to talk about. Let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Indianapolis, Indiana is Angela Odoms Young. She's an associate professor of kinesiology and nutrition at University of Illinois at Chicago. With us from Grand Rapids, Michigan is Lisa Weidman. She is the president and CEO for Meals on Wheels, Western Michigan. Here in Washington, Joseph Williams is the senior news editor at US News and World Report. And we have Jack Bobo, the CEO of Futurity in Washington, D.C. Welcome to you all. Jack, let me begin with you. How and why has the COVID-19 pandemic made food security such a big problem? Explain it to us. <laughs> well, you know, there, there are a lot of reasons, and it really comes back to the supply chain. Um, at every place in the supply chain, it's been impacted by COVID. So people getting the seeds they need in order to plant them or to be able to uh, produce the food, to be able to transport the food to where it needs to be processed, processing facilities that have been shut down because workers are getting COVID, and then getting it to the grocery stores. And of course, all the restaurants are shut down because people weren't able to go. And so at each point in the food supply chain, there have been disruptions. And those disruptions have either left people out of work or uh, where food couldn't get to them. And so it's you know led to global hunger, not just here in the United States, but everywhere around the world. Angela, why are people of color seem to be impacted the most? Also, women uh, who are ahead of households. So it's part of a systemic problem that always existed. So when we see uh, something like COVID happen, people that are already vulnerable and at risk for food insecurity will be disproportionately at risk. 
So when you look at people of color, I, I have higher rates of poverty, higher rates of unemployment. And then COVID has just exacerbated that. So the food insecurity rates have essentially escalated uh, in populations that were already at risk for food insecurity even before the pandemic. And I was reading somewhere that the oldest and youngest are often hit the hardest. Is that true? Yes. So when we think about our seniors, so 60 plus uh, in early childhood, and those populations are particularly vulnerable when it comes to the negative effects of food insecurity. So the health conditions, so you think early life development, and then in older age, many people have the burden of chronic health conditions. So they may also be less likely to be able to get out and get food or when our normal system where seniors are able to take advantage of things like congregate meals, all of those things have been impacted uh, with COVID. Joseph, uh, let me uh, talk about the government approach. Has the Biden administration done enough to help people? What are they doing? Well, the first and foremost thing that they would point to is the child tax credit, which will distribute $300 to $500 to each family uh, in the United States that has children. That's the one that they would most likely point to uh, because it is going to be direct aid. It's going to put money in people's pockets, and that in turn will help them uh, be able to buy food. But the problem that that's running into is people need that money also for rent, for utilities, for medicine, for a, a myriad of things uh, beyond food. And a lot of that money doesn't go very far in some of the places where it's being distributed. Uh, take Washington, D.C., for instance, one of the most expensive cities in America, and that's if you don't have uh, a job. If you don't have a job, you're, you're unhoused. You're more likely to be unhoused. You're more likely to live in one of the uh, poorer wards that your correspondent talked about. And there, there are food deserts. And uh, the government has been trying to address that, but that has not worked out so well because uh, the government has been looking at increased uh, benefits for SNAP. Uh, that's uh, a food assistance program. But almost at every turn, it gets blocked because of the amount of money that's involved and because of the requirements that uh, those on the right want to make sure that, that the people who are receiving that aid uh, have a legitimate shot or at least are trying to find work. I want to make sure I have this right. So Biden administration actually increased uh, SNAP payments by, uh, by, I believe, 15 percent a month for all recipients. But that is not supposed to last much longer in a number of states. Uh, Joseph, Jack, Lisa, let me bring in Lisa. Um, how important is that 15 percent? That actually goes a long way, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, one of the unfortunate things, though, about the SNAP benefits is that older adults or individuals that are homebound um, have had difficulty using those. So it's been uh, really uh, quite the, I would say, surprise, not even a surprise, um, that so many of seniors have come to us for help since the pandemic started. <laughs> Well, let me move on to um, what so many people in this country are going through. Um, and I would love to hear some personal stories um, from you guys as well, especially you, Lisa, um, about Meals on Wheels. Let's listen from a woman in Baltimore, I believe, who has heavily dependent on food assistance. Her name, I believe, is Rosa. We don't have the economic resources to buy food and to survive. If we have enough for the rent, then we don't have enough to survive. You know what I mean? So that's why we come to where they distribute food, because we can't get it otherwise. How important are these nonprofit programs, Lisa, like what you're involved in, uh, Meals on Wheels, Western Michigan? Oh, it's, it's so vital. Um, when the pandemic hit, <clears throat> we had over 700 new older adults uh, come to us for help. They weren't able to go to the grocery stores. Uh, most of them, uh, we have a, a large number of homebound seniors, but uh, families were afraid to visit. Um, there were just so many uh, new and 
um, startling. Lisa, things how did they how did they find you? I mean, I'm a daughter of a senior citizen, and I have an older sister, and my sister is instrumental in helping our senior uh, parents taking in places during the pandemic. So I'm curious, a lot of these seniors you're talking about, how did they find out about your organization? How did they get there? Um, well, there's a number of ways. Um, you know, hospitals all know about us. Social workers all know about us. We are part of the uh, Michigan 211 system with United Way that is a statewide network where people can call and look for resources. So we are listed with that organization and the state of Michigan also um, made sure that there was a, a central website uh, where people could inquire for food assistance. Um, so a lot of people came to us um, through both the 211 system and um, the state of Michigan. Um, and, and really, um, there's a lot of word of mouth that happens there, too. A lot of people know about us, but nobody, uh, people don't think they're ever going to need us. But all of a sudden, um, with the pandemic, um, a lot of those needs really came to light. Uh, Joseph and Jack, um, are things getting better or worse for a while there? It seemed like we may be, there may be a glimmer of hope and we're on our way to some kind of recovery. And then the Delta variant hit. And um, I'm curious, um, are things going to get worse when it comes to food insecurity? Jack, let me go to you. Yeah, maybe I'll start with some of the global picture and then uh, let Joseph take the domestic. Because, you know, the you're, you're absolutely right. With Delta, it's really impacting a lot of countries around the world. And, of course, much of the food in the United States is imported. It has a very long supply chain. And so those disruptions in distant places will ultimately impact what's available in the grocery store in the United States and what's available there. And so I think that we did think that we were through the other side, the problems that were happening uh, in the meat process industry and others. Uh, we thought that we had gotten past them, uh, but with some recent decisions by some of the food processors to insist that all of the employees uh, have the vaccine, I think there's a recognition that we could see a return to some of the problems that we're seeing at this time last year. Joseph, do you agree? Uh, I agree. Uh, in the United States, the picture is slightly different. The biggest threat here, in addition to supply chain, is also the fact that we have this uh, 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 variant that's happening, and that could shut down schools, which is a very important uh, food program for people who don't have it. But also inflation uh, is a very real threat. Uh, the price of milk, the price of bread, everything going up at the same time that workers' pays remain stagnant. That's a problem that we're going to have to address in, in the United States. But I think that uh, in addition to worrying about the supply chain, even the home manufacturers, we saw earlier in the pandemic that the uh, meatpacking facilities were forced to show, slow down or, or stop production because you had workers who get infected in COVID. Uh, and that's part of the problem there because we have workers working in close proximity. Uh, it's a whole other issue with the food supply chain, how the food gets from, uh, say, a feedlot to your table. Mm -hmm. But um, certainly in the United States, inflation is probably going to be the biggest short-term factor. Uh, authorities and government say it's not going to last for very long, but that doesn't matter if you're hungry and you need to buy some food and you don't have enough mo money for that food to go around. And in a lot of cases, people don't have the option um, or can't really afford healthy food options. Let's listen to an economist uh, from Food and Agriculture Organization. We have around 3 billion people that won't have access to healthy diets, which is the diets we need to be able to improve in nutrition and improve any form of malnutrition in the world. Three billion people don't have access to healthy diets. Angela, how do we fix it? I think part of it is reframing. You know, we've talked about food security. There's this emerging concept of nutrition security. Really, we need to kind of think broadly about this idea, not only about food, but as you mentioned, the types of food. So partly is in production. We need to make sure that that food is available. Uh, also, you talked about access to grocery stores and other types of retail outlets where you can get fruits and vegetables. So it has to be accessible. And then affordable. Affordability is definitely an issue. Uh, we need to make sure as far as prices and then within our broader system, as was mentioned, many people depend on the charitable food system to get access to food. And we need to make sure that though that 
those charitable food sites are able to access healthy food. Um, we need to make sure that they have storage. Mm -hmm. So part of it is supporting the charitable food system to ensure that they have the infrastructure to provide healthy food options. And we need to think again broader. Where do we access food and where can we make sure that people can get uh, either incentives for healthy foods, like through health care, how can health care support healthy food access, uh, how can we have healthy foods in schools. So it's really looking at kind of nutrition and all policies, uh, at least when we think about the U.S., to make sure people have that access. Jack, do you agree? Accessibility and affordability. Yeah, well, it, both of those things are incredibly important and just what Angela said. I guess I would add on to it, it's our food environment needs to be changed so that it can begin to deliver healthy outcomes. 42% of all Americans are obese, 75% are overweight or obese. And so uh, poor nutrition can look different. It's not just about not having enough to eat, but it's not having the right food to eat. And we need to think of ways of ensuring that the food that's delivered to people, as Angela said, is healthy food that's gonna lead to a healthier life. And it's not just feeding people, but it's nourishing them as well. Lisa, I would love to hear some stories um, that you've heard about in your experience during this pandemic from some of the seniors that came to you. Is there anything that stands out in your mind that a story or an experience, um, so many of us have, have had different ones during this crisis, but one that will always stay with you. I think that, um, gosh, our, our drivers, um, when they are delivering uh, meals, have probably um, one of the biggest jobs because they're, they are connecting with those seniors. and when we weren't able to do that in the way that we'd like to, which is um, to maybe go in and chat for a few minutes, um, became very um, apparent just how important that human um, connection is within the food system. Um, we want people to have access to healthy foods and we have a program that allows people to choose uh, healthy meals um, based on their various preferences, um, dietary needs, cultural preferences, religious preferences, um, and ultimately to get them to consume those meals. But those seniors, um, one in particular um, sticks out um, that, that came to us. Um, she was very proud. Um, she really wasn't used to asking for help, um, but her family was out of town, um, didn't even live in Michigan. And you know, it was one of the last things that she wanted to do was to, to call us and ask for help. Um, but she was at very high risk. Uh, she had COPD. She couldn't uh, dare get out to go to the grocery store. Um, and so she called us for help. And just knowing that we made a difference um, when we got uh, to provide services to her, we learned about so many different um, other needs that she had. Um, and just that we were able to make, uh, make a difference and uh, make sure that she had healthy food to eat when her family couldn't provide for her. Um, you know, that, that happens every day here. And so, you know, that, that story, uh, multiply that over and over again. Uh, the Meals on Wheels Network experiences that regularly. Joseph, are there parts of the United States that are hurting more when it comes to food insecurity than other parts? Well, uh, it's specifically, there are some parts, uh, basically the, the, the entire country has this issue. We've got rural populations that have the problem, urban populations that have the problem, uh, and we don't necessarily have unified systems in order to make sure that everybody gets enough and that the food is distributed equally. Uh, in urban centers, it can be kind of hidden, uh, right, where you have people either on the streets or living in uh, apartments, and you don't see behind those doors that they are really food insecure. Uh, you might see it at food where, uh, rather at school, where uh, young people come in early in the morning to try to get a good healthy breakfast, but then you go to rural populations. I was in Mississippi a couple of years ago, um, and uh, I went up to the Delta, and there was a school there that had an entire storage cabinet with full of provisions that not only helped feed these children, but they were allowed to take some home to their families. And that's something you would not even imagine, mm -hmm. because not even a mile from where the school was, there's a farm. 
uh, growing uh, soybeans, growing corn. So you're right in the middle of a food basket, and there still are people that are going hungry. Uh, a lot of it, however, relates to income and poverty, because if you have a poor area anywhere, likely you're finding somebody who's got food insecurity, and there are poor areas all across the country, not just in big city centers. Angela, how important is education in all of this? I think education at all levels become, um, becomes very important. A lot of times we think about education of only consumers. So nutrition education and our nutrition education system in the United States is pretty advanced when it comes to um, its link with food assistance. So we have SNAP Ed, which is SNAP Education. We have WIC and those programs. We have FNEP, uh, the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program. Those uh, programs have been in existence for many years and they serve low-income families. What we don't really have is we don't have a national system of nutrition education at all levels, at all income levels. And that's really important um, to make sure that nutrition education is in our normal infrastructure. Uh, I think the other place where education is important is in policies and also the general public. Many times we blame consumers for not making healthy choices, mm -hmm. but I think uh, what was mentioned around environment, availability, accessibility, community infrastructure, economic development, uh, poverty, how do we address those root causes? And this year, we've also seen an increase in awareness around systemic racism. It's not only just those populations are at risk by chance, it's because of historical policies that have put people at a disadvantage. And so it's important that we think broader, that we educate consumers across the board, uh, but we also look at how do we educate people about those policies and investments that are need needed in communities to really change the infrastructure to support health and nutrition. And that's such an important point. And another um, uh, part of this conversation has to do with food waste. Uh, Jack, is there anything that we can do about that? I mean, so much food around the world goes to waste every day to save that food and help the people who need it. Yeah, about a third of food is wasted, 30 to 40 percent. Um, it's a different problem in different places. In the developing world, most of the food is wasted before it reaches the consumer. In the developed world, the United States and Europe, it's wasted m mostly after the consumer. Um, and it's different for different products. And so, you know, how meat versus vegetables or other things, the three most wasted food items are bread, potatoes, and apples. And so there are different supply chains mm -hmm. for each one. So generally, there's a challenge. However, during COVID, there have been steps that have been taken in order to make that easier, to help restaurants and others understand that if they donate that food, they're not actually at risk of liability and other things that um, have made it easier to take the food that would normally be in large packaging and uh, resort it so that it's easier to distribute to people. And so steps have been taken to ensure the safety of the food, but to make it a little bit more flexible so that food doesn't go to waste. And so I think that there has been a lot of attention to that over the last year. There's obviously a lot more that can happen. Uh, we can, you know, people are confused by things like best buy dates, you know, does, is that a safety or is that a quality issue? And so there are things that we can do to, to make it easier for people to make good decisions about the food so that safe and healthy food doesn't go to waste. Does it surprise any of you that in the world's most powerful country, the number one economy in the world, we are addressing such a serious issue of hunger and food insecurity. Joseph. Uh, surprisingly, I, I, I can't say that I'm surprised, mainly because I grew up in this country and I kind of understand uh, this country's checkered history and I understand that uh, the way the system is set up waste and, 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 and people uh, turning backs on food that could serve other people, it's just kind of the way that the United States has become. It doesn't have to be this, it doesn't have to be this way, but the problem is that we have this problem and we're not very intentional about solving it. Uh, we are treating it as an afterthought. 
we uh, see the people in food lines and kind of shake our heads sadly and say, tsk, tsk, you know, too bad for them, and then we'll go get uh, a sack of potatoes and let half of them go to waste. Uh, and But the, I think what, what is happening now in the United States is that it's climbing up the class ladder. No longer is it absolutely uh, poor people, people who've been poor for a long time, who are f experiencing food insecurity, but it's also people in the middle class, people who have lost their jobs because of COVID, uh, people who have been uh, getting a, a living wage, but that's been cut in half. Uh, I think a lot of the problem stems from the fact that we don't really treat poverty intentionally in the United States. And even as it's creeping up the class ladder, more people are being affected by this. We need a national strategy, and so far we don't have one. Jack, we don't have a national strategy. That's the problem. Yeah, it is. And a lot of this has really raised awareness of just how important our food system is. Uh, there are parallel efforts that are taking place at the United Nations right now. There's the UN Food System Summit that'll be taking place in just a couple of months. And so there is a, glo a growing global awareness that our food system in, in some ways is broken. I mean, when you have 700 million people going to bed hungry, clearly there's a problem. And that problem has been greatly exacerbated over the last year. Uh, so there are efforts to address it. it. It is complicated, however. By fixing one piece of it, you uh, you could undermine another. The resilience in our food system means having slack so that you have inventory and other things, but that can lead to higher cost. And so there are often trade-offs between the things you do in order to try to fix the food system. You may make another part of it a little bit less uh, good. Angela, final thoughts? We've got about 30 seconds. Yeah, I think um, addressing the root causes of food insecurity and strengthening the food system, as we mentioned. Really to address those root causes, we do need an economic strategy to deal with poverty. Um, and COVID has really not only revealed new things, but old things. And so I think that we need to look and take a hard look and a closer look at our food system and then also our economic system uh, when it comes to how we address poverty in the United States. And Lisa, we don't want to leave you out. So final thoughts from you. Yeah, I think it's really important to look at the big picture and the root causes. Um, and I am really afraid um, for our older adults as, as we move into the future because older adults are going to outnumber kids by 2034. And that means that fewer people are, uh, fewer kids are going to be available to take care and feed um, their family members um, that are in need. And so systemically, something has to change. All right. Fascinating conversation. I certainly uh, learned a lot. Thank you for all that you're doing. Important conversation. We have to leave it there. I'm Asiye Namdar in Washington. Thank you so much for watching another edition of The Heat.